Ah, the Enlaw. Yes, the most over-preached, over-talked about anti-tank weapon system you could ever imagine other than the Javelin, especially within the six to eight month period that we've been involved with the Ukrainian conflict that is going on today. Enlaw is one of the mass-produced anti-tank weapon systems that is somewhat misunderstood, overhyped, I would say somewhat, and uh, what seems to be a misconstrued basis of the ultimate anti-tank weapon system and i've done some recent videos about how you know uh, i feel that the western world is quite heavily addicted to anti-tank weapon systems and rightly so the end law is a incredibly good and effective anti-tank missile platform there is so many videos on this missile platform i am producing one right now as a testament to how good it is people that are doing content on it Today's video, though, is talking a little bit more about from the horse's mouth. Now, I'm not the horse, although I sound, I sound like a horse sometimes, especially today with a bit of a bunged up nose. No, I'm not the horse. The horse's mouth today is actually going to be from Saab. Now, I have a huge respect for Saab. No, not the car Saabs that were back in the UK when I used to watch them pulled over by the side of the road with the uh, radiator cap exploded off with the uh, steam with the mechanical issues they had. No, we're talking about defense Saab. Yes, the Gripen. We all know of the Gripen, the uh, fighter jet that they produced, one of my most respected multi-role aircraft out there. But the end lore is definitely up there in terms of my respect. And they recently announced a video that I'd like to go through with you today to really hear about the facts and the information about this anti-type platform. Now, let's be dead straight here, folks. It's going to be pretty biased. Um, twofold, why it's going to be a little bit biased today's video. First of all, as I said, it is coming from the horse's mouth. The supplier, the manufacturer, uh, and the advocate for this missile system is talking about it directly. So, of course, any competitor or any other anti-tank platform out there is going to have, you know, not a huge say in this matter. What I find interesting about this video is it's trying to sort of... Uh, clarify some things you know there are a lot of videos that i watch from other channels some great channels out there that have made some really good videos about this weapon system especially in its recent use and i have actually found quite a few inadequacies uh, i wouldn't say inadequacies that's a horrible word to use inaccuracies in some of the content or the information they provided about this platform because some people for some reason have mixed it up with javelin um and other platforms as well including the carl g which ironically is also produced from this manufacturer and i'd like to sort of go through today's video and just speak to it a little bit myself and maybe you'll have some tidbits you want to put in the comment section but let's go through the video i thought it was very well made and uh, just have a little chat about it the enlaw anti-tank system has attracted plenty of praise in recent months Short for Next Generation Light Anti-Tank Weapon, this shoulder-fired guided missile system is so simple that it can be used effectively by soldiers with minimal training. Okay, so the first thing I like about this video, being as I said, it comes from the horse's mouth from the supplier, is that it's so simple to use. A lot of sophisticated anti-tank weapon systems, such as Javelin, etc, etc, even the tow system, are a little bit more complex to use. They're still basically very simple. I mean, they have to be, especially if idiots like me have been trusted to potentially use them. Um, but seriously, though, when it comes to Enlaw, it is exactly what it says on the tin. A very simple system to use that of combat of today, what we're finding is a lot of troops have not been given even some of the most basic of training. Yet you can pick up an Enlaw and shoot it through the basic optics that it has, whether it be a small optic like an ACOG, uh, you know, just a basic rifle sight, you can pick this thing up and do just as much damage with it as you could with a more sophisticated system like, you know, Javelin or even, uh, you know, tow systems or Spike ATGMs. There's a lot of other more sophisticated systems, but Enlaw provides you that, I hate to say it, but idiot's guide to anti-tank weapon systems. And that's great because a lot of the people that are going into combat, just like that in Ukraine, they're carpenters, they're butchers, they're, you know, brickies. They're, they're not used to using sort of high-tech weapon systems. They're used to just, hey, what do I, what do I got to do? Point me in the right direction. Where's the enemy? Give me a pointy stick and let me shoot it. And that's what Enlaw provides. So I like the fact that they put that in the basic start to this video is, at the end of the day, it's simple and it works. Its ability to stop main battle tanks dead in their tracks anywhere from 20 to 800 meters has made headlines around the planet. Now, again, they focus back on the headlines around the planet. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, Enlaw has been non-stop talked about. Look, I'm talking about it today. But 800 meters, 800 meters is a very, very effective range to take out a tank. Now, when I say take out a tank, if you notice in this particular footage, you can see the projectile hit the tank, but didn't actually blow it up. It's probably an inert uh, dummy husk. But 800 meters is still very effective to 
give a mobility kill. It doesn't have to be a K kill. Mobility kills can be just as damaging as a full destructive uh, warhead, such as Javelin knocking out, you know, the ammunition inside the tank. You don't need to destroy the tank for you to defeat it. If it's immobilized or the half of the crew of it's knocked out, it's pretty out of action, okay? Armor is not designed to be a huge standoff weapon. It's designed to be pushed in as a spearhead, puncture through the lines, allowing the infantry to follow in. If you can knock out a tank from just immobilizing it for at least, you know, a few hours, that gives the infantry enough time to scoot around this thing and do more damage elsewhere. Endlore is not really that sort of criticality of needing to totally immortalize the tank into the underworld. It's there to, hey, I'm going to stop you in your tracks. Literally, you're not going anywhere. I'm going to be able to either put another round in with you shortly um, at closer range or provide support from other battle groups or other assets around to knock you out. And that's why I really like Enlor because it doesn't necessarily need to destroy the tank. It just needs to put it out of action. But there's also been a degree of confusion. Some people refer to Enlor as a British system. Others say it's a Saab system. So where exactly does Enlor come from? What are the features that make it so effective, and how do soldiers use Enlaw in the field? In truth, Enlaw is a symbol of international cooperation. It came about when the British Ministry of Defence and the Swedish... Sorry, I have to interrupt this. Look at the camouflage patterns going on here. We've got the Swedish camouflage pattern, which is already badass. I absolutely love the Swedish camo pattern. Uh, and we also have the old school, what I used to wear, British... DPM, Disruptive Pattern Material. This is old school woodland DPM. I miss it. I love it. Um, you got a fusilier there. Looks like he's about to punch open a brand new Enlaw tube. Really, really cool. But it's a really interesting dynamic to see both British and Swedish soldiers working together in this setup. Also love the uh, the tailgate Land Rover setup at the back there. Of course, I do love my Land Rovers. I used to own one. Uh, sadly, I had to put it to another home. But uh, just had to interrupt the video just to do my respect and dues to these two camouflage schemes. British Armed Forces both decided to create a new system to defeat increasingly powerful enemy tanks in the 1990s. Saab was tasked with developing a new system to meet the MOD specifications, and in 2009 we delivered Enlaw to the British, Swedish and Finnish Defence Forces. So, that's interesting. Three different forces looking for a new anti-tank weapons platform. You'll notice that uh, the Americans are not really involved in this. You know, the AT-4 system was really sort of their fire-and-forget systems or throw tube. Uh, Enlaw wasn't really predominantly a weapon system they chose. Looks like the Europeans really wanted to link together a little bit here with a joint venture with Saab. And good for them. Um, I know for a fact many people I've spoken to in the British Army have absolutely loved using Enlaw. Um, I myself have never used one. I wish I could have. have used Javelin, but unfortunately not Enlaw. Um, I would love to have, but, uh, you know, really, really good results from those who I've spoke to. Unfortunately, I haven't spoken to anyone from Sweden or from Finland that have used this, uh, this weapon system before. But if you have used it yourself, please let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to hear about it. Today, the Enlaw system is assembled by aeronautics company Talus in Northern Ireland from components made in a wide range of countries. So it's a truly international product. Now, why does that matter? Why does an international product matter? Well, it, it does matter because when you look at sole source uh, components, i.e. components that are produced in one country, that country is trying to get its raw material, its logistics, its supply chain, everything from its own internal sources or trying to pull from other countries. When you have suppliers that manufacture across the multiple spectrums of different countries, the infrastructure of logistics is more conducive to getting products built quickly. Uh, here's one thing that's worked very well for, say, the Israelis. They tend to have sole source manufacturing, but they also have a huge amount of budget for that. And they have factories that have been specifically designated and suppliers that have been specifically designated for one particular item. You'll notice in this scenario, different nations are wanting to capitalize on one weapon system. So they're using what's best use for them use different countries to resource and outsource suppliers all over the world and they're going to get their parts and components quicker which is why you're seeing Enlaws produced at such an extraordinary rate to be supplied to places like Ukraine. So I actually really um, advocate for international partnerships. I know a lot of people like sort of uh, you know home homemade weapon systems you know uh, coming from a sole source supplier etc etc or sort of you know common use uh, parts that are used from the same country but at the, at the end of the day 
you want a system like this, a specifically something like this, you know, a, um, <clears throat> a one-time use system to be able to be mass produced without any interruptions to the supply chain or the flow of those uh, weapons getting to the user. And of course, when you use international suppliers like this, it's going to speed up production significantly. And trust me, I know this. I work in logistics. That's how it works. Uh, it really does advocate so much faster for the supply chain of products like this. Saab's Enlor has become one of the planet's most talked about weapon systems, thanks to its ability to stop main battle tanks in their tracks. The system is so simple, so transportable and so accurate that it can be successfully used after even a brief training session. Now they're going to mention a little bit more about this later on in the video, but the recoil of this thing is just... It actually really blows my mind how almost zero recoil is produced from this system. Now, I had a question from a friend of mine at work the other day. He says, Matt, why do they have those gigantic cones on the front? What are those big spongy cones for? Well, when you're using a system like this, although it's not highly sophisticated, it still has quite a few sensors, systems inside of there for the ballistics of the warhead to be carefully protected. It doesn't take much on the battlefield when you're throwing these inside of vehicles or inside, you know, helicopters or whatever else that you're taking these things on for those tubes to be dented or smashed. The tubes themselves made sort of a fiberglass reinforced Kevlar style setup of the tube. Although they're very strong, it doesn't take much to damage or bang the edges of those things. And once you start crimping the edges of tubes at a very tight tolerance fit with the warhead in there, it's not a good time. So these big cumbersome spongy pads or styrofoam kind of setups on the front are there to protect the warhead because there's nothing worse than having a lot of money, and these aren't cheap, being damaged by some idiot throwing it in the back of the warrior or the uh, or the lav or whatever else you have because they weren't careful with it. And you don't have time to be protective with all your components all the time. Sometimes you just need to lob the damn thing in the back of the vehicle. These spongy pads, although look a little cumbersome, a little ridiculous, and a little bit heavy, they're not because they're light um, and they don't obscure anything, but they, they are taking up more physical space. But they're there as a very important matter of protecting this system so that when you pull it out ready to go, it will fire without any problems. These characteristics aren't the result of chance. Right from the earliest design stage, Britain's Ministry of Defence provided Saab with a clear brief on the features that we needed to include in Enlil. It was essential that the system was powerful enough to defeat main battle tanks and to help turn the course of battles. At the same time, it couldn't be too complex. The MOD insisted that everyone from a gunner down to a cook or a logistics officer needed to be able to fire it. Okay, don't ever give a logistics officer. Just those two words alone are very upsetting, okay? When you're given logistics, an officer in the same sentence, and then put an anti-tank weapon system in there, or you better believe you want to be 360 away from that guy. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't get offended. Don't get offended. No, but the reality is that, as I said earlier in the video, these systems have to be used by just, one, just about anyone, idiot-proof. And they've designed it purely for that, to be able to pull the cap off, pull the, uh, you know, the safety pin off this thing, look through the optics, and off it goes. That is a huge testament to how well these things have been working. Another requirement was for Enlaw to be man-portable to be able to be carried by a single soldier, and it had to be light enough to be shoulder-fired. Its munitions needed to be insensitive, able to withstand shock, heat, and adjacent detonating munitions, and it had to be fit for use in built-up environments where modern conflicts often occur. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen that footage of the Enlaw being launched at the back of, I think it was a T-72, maybe a T-80 in Ukraine. Minimum arming distance, about 20 meters for this projectile, but it looks in the particular video that it did not arm on time and basically just bounced off the back of the turret uh, with the, uh, the prime motor still going. Of course, there is a very heavy uh, requirement for this system to be used in built-up or urban areas, especially what we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment. And again, something that is really, really focused upon with using of the Enlaw is that it can be fired in close proximity to other buildings, other people even, without the huge necessity for worrying about backblast clear and all that good stuff. Now, any anti-tank weapon system, when you fire, of course, you're going to want the backblast area to be completely clear. But unlike the recoilless fight rifle out of the Carl G., um, the Enlaw <laughs> does have a little bit less of a reduced backblast than some of the heavier duty weapon systems that are out there, such as Javelin, etc. But Javelin is unique in the fact that it doesn't have that initial blast 
that it has um, with Enlor because it has a primary and secondary sort of motor stage. So it pops out of the tube and then ignites the main motor, which pushes off to go and engage the target. Enlor is similar to that somewhat, but at the end of the day, it's still pushing a lot of blast out the back. So if you're shooting this thing in a confined space, yeah, you, you're going to want to be covering your ears and getting ready for it. Is it any wonder that the unit system that Saab produced has now caught the attention of the world? Saab's Enlor system is so effective at destroying main battle tanks that you might find yourself asking the question, why aren't all anti-tank systems made the same way? Why aren't all anti-tank systems made the same way? Please tell me. While there are other systems on the market, none provide the same game-changing combination of ease of use, transportability and affordability that Enlor does. Yeah, I'll give you that. By the way, look at the state of that picture there. It looks like the Enlor's bent in half. Um, I have to agree, you know, as much as I love Javelin, I love Spike anti-tank guided missile, which by the way, the Spike is my favorite anti-tank AGM, it just, it truly is, the, the capabilities of the Spike is incredible. Um, I have to admit, in terms of, you know, man-portable, simplistic style ATGMs, Enlaw is definitely up there. I do have a strong, strong passion for the Carl G, of course because uh, we do use that here in Canada. Um, but, uh, you know, they're coming back into fashion big time, the Carl G. I've done videos on it before. In, before. Go check them out. But I have to relate to everything that this person is and the, what Saab's saying here is Enlaw's got it figured out for sure. The answer is that when Enlaw was developed, Saab was in a unique position to produce a system that brought together the simplicity of a shoulder-fired weapon with the extreme accuracy of a guided missile. By the 1990s, when work began on the project, we already had decades of experience producing our shoulder-fired Carl Gustav and AT4 recoiler systems. Rugged and easy to use, both remain weapons of choice for ground forces. Now, the Carl G, as I mentioned before, is heavily coming back into um, you know armed forces around the world, especially in the special forces world. I have done videos on this because. Um, the Carl G obviously is reusable. I can keep putting rounds in it all day long and different customizable rounds too. Smoke rounds, flechette rounds if you wanted to. There's all sorts of capability there. Entlaw is a little bit more restrictive in its customization, but for the most part it has features that the Carl G does not have uh, that's a lot more prominent. At the same time, we were experts in guided missile technology, thanks to our work developing the Bill, RBS-70 and BAMSA systems for customers around the world. Ah, the bill. Yes, I've wanted to do a video on the bill for quite some time. There's a fantastic video of a bill being fired at a, I believe it was a Centurion or maybe a Chieftain of some kind. Uh, there's some footage of it getting struck by a bill uh, and it cooks off. The tank cooks off as it's driving. It looks incredible. The sparks popping out the bottom of the turret. I would strongly encourage you to watch that video, but uh, the bill is also predominantly well-made anti-tank guided missile of course in its day uh being superseded by uh, things like enlaw but uh, they they know what they're talking about they know the capabilities of what they've produced in the past have been developed and refined for enlaw to be one of the best anti-tank guided missiles in the world we knew the two technologies could produce extraordinary results if put together but creating enlaw also required us to bring together knowledge in other areas including system safety warheads proximity fuses and propulsion we also applied our knowledge on guided systems, advanced electronics, mechanics, lightweight materials, and human-machine interfaces. Creating Enlaw involved designing and testing different components and materials, with engineers then slowly scaling up to tests involving the full weapon. At the Saab Bone Force Test Center in Karlskoga, we carried out vibration and environmental tests, and finally test firings. Seriously though, look at the recoil on that! That is incredible, incredible, that troop. It looks like a Swedish troop has been put in testing here, firing such a large size projectile with almost zero recoil. Incredible, very, very impressive. By the time the system was delivered to the first customers in 2009, Enlaw was fully tested, fit for purpose, and ready for use against main battle tanks. Now, when you look at that, you think, well, it's nothing. It's probably, what, a Malteser size hole? I'll tell you this much. <laughs> If that's coming through that much metal at that speed, coming into the inside of a hull of a tank, there's not going to be much left inside. It's literally like an indoor pinball machine. Uh, and it would be god-awful experiencing just a small projectile of that kind punching through the side of that much armor. The pressure that's pushing through there is enough to just annihilate anything inside the hull or the turret. Um, a lot of people have mentioned to me in the past about, you know, well, you know, 
it's 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 a done deal. Once this gets into the hull of the tank and hits the ammunition, it's done for. Modern day tanks of today are starting to protect more heavily against um, spall and you know uh, fragments or projectiles that are sort of ricocheting inside of the hull to then create some catastrophic ammunition breach. Um, Soviet era style tanks clearly do not protect as much against things like that. And we know that the Abrams and other tanks of the world, of the Western world, do have more predominantly protected ammunition. But think about this if it can punch through the hull of the vehicle, if that much velocity and weight of this, whatever it may be, is coming through, the combination of metals that are coming through at this point, there's no protection inside that hull that's going to protect you at that point. Um, the ammunition at some point, if this projectile within the pinball system of it sort of detonating inside the vehicle hits one of those protective armored cages you're done for anyway right so there's only so much protection you can have of your ammunition uh, and this is clearly going to defeat it without any doubt there are plenty of options on the market for armed forces looking to acquire an anti-tank system but there's only one end law no other system has proved so effective and so easy to use against main battle tanks. So what is it that sets Enlar apart? And what makes it the obvious choice for deployed ground forces who need to neutralize tanks? For a start, there's Enlar's range. It can be fired up to 800 meters from the target and right down to 20 meters from the target. That makes it highly effective, everywhere from built up urban environments to the countryside. Then there's the choice between direct attack and overfly top attack mode. Now, this is where information starts to get a little inaccurate on some videos I've watched in the past because they believe it's a top-down attack ammunition. In some regard, it is, okay? It is somewhat coming down as a top-down attack. But if you notice, the projectile's trajectory is still somewhat straight, although just going over the top of the vehicle, it is not penetrating directly as a warhead towards the uh, top of the turret inside of the projectile though or the warhead is pushing the projectile downwards but it's not its trajectory of velocity is not coming up and top down attack which is what javelin is doing this system is a little bit different in the way in which it sort of tracks or senses the target underneath it and fires downwards it, i think it's actually more sophisticated in my eyes more than say javelin or spike uh, because it's it's i mean to me it's able to distinguish between the giant rock or the giant tank. I think that's fantastic. I think it's really cool. Uh, and, and I wouldn't say truly a top-down attack munition, but doing just as much damage as what one would in a case of taking out a Soviet old-style era of tank. Enlor enables you to destroy main battle tanks, whether they are standing still, on the move, or even partially concealed behind obstacles. Unlike many anti-tank systems, Enlor doesn't require precise information on range to target to be accurate. You just track the target for three to six seconds and pull the trigger. The guidance system does the rest. And there you go. The guidance system, right? The system is helping you out. It's doing what it needs to do. You're not working your ass off trying to do all the calculations in your brain or with the optics, just like the Carl G, to make sure you put the appropriate lead, etc., etc., on the target. Once you've got onto the target, it takes over, right? That is game changer. That is what you need for the idiot's guide or foolproof guide to anti-tank weapon systems. I love it. Enlor is super quick to deploy. From carrying Enlor in your hand to having an effect on the target takes less than 10 seconds. Look at that fancy little singular uh, stake there that he's using to stabilize. I think that's really cool. Considering the recoil is bare nothing, um, I actually really like this little standalone pod just to allow you to get even more accurate. Um, that thing isn't heavy heavy, but it's still pretty beefy. And when you're holding onto a target for a certain period of time, uh, if you're shooting up to 800 meters, it can still be fairly hard to track onto a target with something like that. Having that extra stability is really, really nice. Uh, also, sometimes you may be opting for a target that's coming across your field of view and then disappears and comes back again. It could take time to track a target. It's not always just, you know, you pop it open like this guy does, instantly find a target and shoot. Sometimes you'll be potentially waiting on point for a while. You know, it's almost like an anti-tank sentry somewhat. Having that bipod there or that singular stand uh, that retracts in and out, I think it's really neat for you if you have to be on station to monitor that, you know, field of fire arc of fire for an extended period of time i think that's really nice and enlor is powerful once the system's dynamically compensated warhead leaves the muzzle it can travel 400 meters in two seconds penetrating armor more than 500 millimeters thick 
Ah, see, I made a bit of an error there. It looks like uh, Enlo also has that sort of dual stage double motor setup. So it pops out the tube and then engages the main motor. So I apologize. I stand corrected. I thought it was a primary motor function similar to that of, uh, you know, old school missile systems. But no, it's if you notice, it actually is doing that double pop. Well, it's pretty cool. It's no wonder that Enlor is known as the ultimate tank killer. If you're a ground combat soldier, it's crucial that you remember one key rule about engaging the enemy. As soon as you take your shot, you reveal your position and become a target yourself. I always find it fascinating. I'm not a, an avid user of MVGs or, or NODs at all, but I always find it strange that the MVGs are left on troops' helmets when it's the middle of the day um, and you're about to shoot an anti-tank gun and missile. Um, I don't know. Why, I guess? Would you not just put it away and protect it? And then those lenses, etc., getting scratched and the blast wave, etc. I, I don't know. That's just me. Um, I've always found it fascinating how the modern world of militaries are just sort of advocating for this. Leave your MVGs on at all times. I'll be honest with you. They're very important bits of kit. I would want, not want to expose them to anything that doesn't need to be exposed to unless it's nighttime or I'm going through buildings and clearing them. And in this scenario, this picture... He's not. Like, I just, I, I, I guess I just don't get it. I, anyway, total sidetrack, I'm sorry. So when you're firing on main battle tanks, your first shot needs to be an effective one. That's why combat troops love Endor. Look at these boys, they are fully rigged up. They've got some nice gear going on there. He's got a Carl G, he's got Enlaws, got some tubes for the Carl G at front there. Very nice setup, very, very nice. Like David and Goliath, Enlaw lets dismounted troops destroy the might of a much more powerful enemy. One of Enlor's greatest advantages is its portability. The system measures a little over a meter long and weighs just 12.5 kilograms, is incredibly well balanced when held in the hand or resting on the shoulder. Enlor is fully disposable and a salt water counter mass system allows it to be safely used in confined spaces, like rooms in urban combat zones. But perhaps the beauty of Enlor is its versatility. In the field, the gunner can select direct attack, where Enlor fires its missile directly into the target. That is nasty. Direct attack with a warhead of that size, you can have a really bad day. Now, if you're not just taking out tanks, you're taking out bunkers, or in this particular instance, a helicopter, there's not going to be much left. Uh, direct attack mode, clearly, I would think, would be the primary function you'd want to have for most engagements of today. Uh, of course, if you're going for a tank behind hull down positions, etc., yeah, you're going to want for more sort of the uh, the delayed impact or the overhead engagement. But just look at the destruction of this thing when it actually hits a projectile uh, receiving object like a helicopter or a flat object. It's it's gnarly. Or he or she can use a toggle to select overfly top attack. This directs the fired missile to fly one meter above the line of sight before coming down to destroy the target. This is useful where a tank might be partially concealed. You can also choose the arming distance if you want the missile to fly blind past an already hit target before it begins detecting targets. Whilst many people have learned of Enlaw for the first time in 2022, the troops who use it have long understood a simple truth. For accuracy, portability and versatility, there is simply no better anti-tank system than Enlaw. So there you have it, the Enlaw. We've talked about it a thousand times, channels have talked about it a thousand times, I've talked about it a thousand times, but I like the fact that Saab has done some of its own homework and said, you know what, thanks for talking about my product over and over and over again, here's the true facts, here's what we really feel about it and what we stand behind, and good for them, I think that's a really good standpoint to have when you're talking about products, things like this, um, they're sort of getting rid of some misconceptions out there. I have to admit, I would love to get my hands on shooting a Saab one day. Um, shooting a Saab. Certainly not shooting a Saab. Maybe shooting a Saab car with a Saab weapon like the Enlor. <laughs> um, I have to admit, I hated Saab cars. <laughs> I hated them in the UK. The people who drove them and the vehicles themselves. Uh, fixing them up for my buddies back in the day. But uh, Enlor. I'd love to hear your opinion on it, folks. Please, please leave me a comment in the comment section below if you've used this before in your own opinions. And, of course, uh, I've increased the flooded content of uh, Enlor a little bit more today, but I hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave me a like, click the little bell by the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time. Also, if you have supported me financially on my channel, either via Patreon or PayPal, or supporting my clothing sponsorship brand, Attire for Effect, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. It really does mean a lot to me and, of course, my sponsor. So thanks again. All the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>